yeah, that's hmm? James Comey. Media says Russia. Russia. Media says Russia. Not voting. Not voting. Electoral College. Facebook. Hillary Clinton. Emails. Racism. Right? Just some sort of stew or mixture uh, all pounded together. But I'm a numbers guy, and the numbers tell a very clear and distinct story. And who's the gentleman that said the Midwest? We lost, we automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs that were largely centered in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa, all the swing states that Donald Trump needed to win and did win. And if you doubt this, there's a straight line up, a direct correlation between the adoption of industrial automation in a voting area and the movement towards Donald Trump. When a factory closes in a town, the jobs disappear, and then that town goes from blue to red very, very quickly. What happened to those manufacturing jobs is now happening to other industries throughout the country. Retail, call centers, fast food, truck driving, and on and on through the economy. The reason why Donald Trump's our president today is that we are in the midst of the greatest economic transformation in the history of our country, the fourth industrial revolution. When is the last time you all heard a politician even say the words fourth industrial revolution? Possibly just now. And I am barely a politician. Now the reason I know this is I spent seven years running an organization I started called Venture for America that helped create thousands of jobs in the Midwest and the South. I'm going to do something a little fun. How many of you grew up here in the D.C. area? But the Northeast, like me. Uh, Midwest? West Coast? South? So I grew up in the Northeast, and before I started Venture for America, I had not spent a lot of time in Missouri or o Alabama or Louisiana or Ohio or the places that Venture for America operated. And I was blown away by the vast gulf between different parts of the country, where if you flew a, uh, if you flew a few time zones between St. Louis and San Francisco or Michigan and Manhattan, you felt like you were traversing decades and dimensions and ways of life and not just a few time zones. And some of you had your hands up before know what I'm talking about. You live in D.C., the per capita richest metro area in the country now, and then you go back to visit your families in other parts of the country, and I'm sure you're struck also by the vast gulf. So I was digesting this for seven years, helped create several thousand jobs around the country, was honored by the Obama administration twice, and people were clapping me on the back saying, hey, great job. And I said, you don't get it. My work is like pouring water into a bathtub that has a giant hole ripped in the bottom. That for every 10 or 20 jobs my organization was creating, we were going to lose 10 or 20,000 jobs. And you can see it in the aftermath uh, of the manufacturing automation wave in places like Detroit, where I spent a lot of time. A city of a peak population, 1.7 million, now has about 680,000 residents. The city's almost two-thirds empty, and that's what happens when you hollow out many of these communities. So we're in the midst of this incredible economic transformation, and for whatever reason, our press, our journalists, our politicians are reluctant to talk about it. This is one reason I'm so thrilled to be here with you all today, is because if we can help our fellow Americans understand that it is not immigrants that are causing these problems, by the numbers, it is not immigrants, it is automation and technology and machines, if you go to a factory in Ohio, you will not find wall-to-wall -wall immigrants. You will find wall-to-wall -wall robot arms. Same with any Amazon fulfillment center. Then we can start focusing on the real problems uh, of this time. How are we going to help millions of Americans manage a transition from an economy of the 20th century to the 21st? And I'm going to go through a few of the most prominent examples that Americans understand about how this is transforming our way of life. Now, if you live in D.C., a very affluent area, you have stores opening here instead of closing. But in most of the country, 30% of stores and malls are closing for good. Now, why is that? One word answer, Amazon, right? Amazon soaking up $20 billion in business every single year. How much did Amazon pay in taxes last year? Zero. Zero. That is the math that most Americans are facing in their communities. $20 billion out, zero back. Meanwhile, being a retail clerk is the most common job in most of the country. The average retail clerk is a 39-year-old woman making between 9 and $10 an hour. 
What is her next job going to be when the store or mall closes? It's a rhetorical question. And no one really knows. When you all call a customer service line of a big company and you get the software or bot, you probably do the exact same thing I do, which is you pound zero, 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 say human, 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 so you get someone on the line, right? Raise your hand if that's what you do. Oh yeah, we all do it. If you don't have your hand up, you're lying. <laughs> or you're just lazy and didn't feel like raising your hand, it's fine. In two or three short years, the software is gonna sound like this. Hey Andrew, how's it going? What can I do for you? It'll be fast, seamless, efficient, delightful, a little bit sexy perhaps. <laughs> What is that going to mean for the two and a half million Americans who work at call centers right now making $14 an hour, average education high school? Driving a truck is the most common job in 29 states in this country. Three and a half million truck drivers. And I said this on the debate stage uh, in Ohio. We have robot trucks on the highways right now. UPS just invested. They're on our highways and the truckers know it. What is this going to mean for the three and a half million Americans who drive a truck for a living or the seven million Americans who work at truck stops, motels, and diners that rely upon the truckers getting out and having a meal? So these are the middle stages of the fourth industrial revolution that's tearing our economy apart. And you can already see it in the numbers and the statistics. Our labor force participation rate is down to 63%, same levels as El Salvador and Costa Rica, if you like international comparables, and then close to a multi-decade low. And then we've seen surges in suicides and drug overdoses in many of these communities to the point that America's life expectancy has declined for the last three years in a row. Do you all know the last time America's life expectancy declined for three years in a row? Spanish flu of 1918, 100 years ago. We're back in Spanish flu territory because of deaths of despair in this country, in large part because millions of Americans are getting pushed to the sidelines and don't feel like they have a path forward. Now, my first move in all of this as the entrepreneur was not to run for president. I came here to DC, to this town, and I met with various leaders and I asked, what are we going to do about the fourth industrial Re revolution, got Donald Trump elected, and the fact is Americans are scapegoating immigrants, things Im immigrants have next to nothing to do with. And what do you think the folks here in DC said to me when I asked, what are we going to do about the fourth industrial revolution? You know this town. What kind of response do you think I got? Hmm? Duh. Duh. No, that's not a DC response. Come on, you can do better than that. DC response is, number one, we cannot talk about that. Number two, we should study that further. And number three, the most common response was, we must educate and retrain all Americans for the jobs of the future. Sounds very responsible. And I said, look, uh, I took a look at the studies. You all want to guess how effective the government-funded retraining programs were for the manufacturing workers who lost their jobs in the Midwest? Ineffective. Throw a number out, sir. That's about right. Uh, zero to 15 percent effectiveness. They were a total dud. Now, of the manufacturing workers that lost their jobs, almost half the, left the workforce for good, forever. And of that group, about half filed for disability, which is one reason you saw disability uh, rates skyrocket during this time. So when I said this to the folks in D.C., I said, look, according to independent studies, we're terrible at retraining. You know what the next response was? I guess we'll get better at it. That is what passes for policy, unfortunately. And one person here in D.C. said something that uh, sent me around the country. He said, look, Andrew, you're in the wrong town. No one here in Washington, D.C. will do anything about this set of problems because this is not a town of leaders, this is a town of followers. And the only way we will do anything about it is if you create a wave in other parts of the country and bring that wave crashing down on our heads. And I heard this and I said, challenge accepted. I'll be back with the wave. So I've been running for president now for over a year and have now raised millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of donors. Our average donation is only $30, so my fans are almost as cheap as Bernie's. <laughs> But there are a lot of them in the Yang Gang, and they know that we have to actually start solving the problems in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa, to have a chance of moving the country forward and defeating Donald Trump in 2020. It's very hard to solve a problem if you don't actually know what that problem is. And instead of the potpourri from cable news, we have a very, very clear set of issues that's arising from the fourth industrial revolution, and it's now accelerating. It's now picking up steam. I spoke to a group of 70 CEOs in New York City, and I asked them, how many of you are looking at having artificial intelligence replace your back office clerical workers? Guess how many hands went up out of 70? All 70. They know what's happening. 
when you talk to business people, they understand that these are the incentives that they have, that we have, and that unfortunately, we have to uh, own up to the truth of the fact our capitalist system is not designed for our well-being, it's designed to maximize capital efficiencies. And increasingly, capital efficiencies will favor artificial intelligence, software, machines, and robots more and more than human beings. So the question is, how do you solve this problem? And one reason why folks in DC don't want to touch it is that people don't like to talk about problems they don't have a solution to. So if you're here today, you heard at some point that there is a candidate for president who wants to give every American $1,000 a month. And the first time you heard that, you thought it was a gimmick, uh, too good to be true, sort of a joke, would never happen. But the truth is, this is not Andrew Yang's idea. Thomas Paine was for this at the founding of the country. He called it the citizen's dividend. Martin Luther King fought for it in the 1960s, called it the guaranteed minimum income for all Americans in his book, Chaos or Community, in 1967. And this is what he was fighting for the day he was assassinated in 1968. A thousand economists endorsed this in the 60s. It passed the U.S. House of Representatives twice under Richard Nixon. It was called a family assistance plan. Came this close to being law. And then 11 years later, one state passed a dividend where now everyone in that state gets between one and two thousand dollars a year, no questions asked. And what state is that? Alaska. And how does Alaska pay for it? And what is the oil of the 21st century? Data, technology, self-driving cars and trucks, artificial intelligence. What they're doing for the people of Alaska with oil money, we can do for everyone in the country with technology money. A study just came out that said that our data is now worth more than oil. How many of you saw that study? How many of you remember getting your data check in the mail? <laughs> Where did the data check go? It didn't get lost, it went to Facebook, Amazon, and Google, and the rest of these near trillion dollar companies that are paying either zero or near zero in taxes. This is why we're looking around wondering where the money went. It's because the money is getting sucked up into the cloud along with our data, along with all of this value, and then we're chasing our tails with an archaic corporate income tax system that's not going to get anywhere near that level of revenue. One estimate said that self-driving trucks, reason why so many people want to automate freight so badly, the savings from self-driving trucks are estimated to be $168 billion a year. Think about that number for a second. And then think about 10 years from now when the self-driving trucks hit the highways, how much of that $168 billion a year will fall into the hands of the American people? Next to none of it. We all know that. Because who's going to get the $168 billion a year? It's going to go to the bottom lines of various companies and various tech companies that are never going to show a profit. So they'll just look around being like, no tax is necessary here. Uh, and then they're, uh, so th these are the economic realities that we're facing in the 21st century. Uh, and this is why we're looking around wondering what the solutions are. So in that context, $1,000 a month actually becomes not just reasonable, it becomes vital. In Alaska, they call this the oil check, and they love it. We're going to call this the tech check, and everyone's going to love it. It's going to help make us stronger, healthier, mentally healthier, less stressed out. It's going to improve relationships, going to improve graduation rates, our workers' abilities to adapt and retrain, people to make meaningful decisions to help adapt for the future. This is the vision of the economy that we have to make real as quickly as possible. Instead of being a pipe dream, it's actually inevitable. It's one reason why futurists like Elon Musk have endorsed me and my campaign. One reason why it feels like we're not doing well, even though the numbers say we're doing great. How many of you were excited about GDP when you woke up this morning? When you said, I'm going to make a big contribution today, I can feel it. No? Not even in DC? <laughs> So GDP is at record highs, uh, but also at record highs right now, stress levels, financial insecurity, student loan debt, suicides, mental illness, drug overdoses, all at record highs or multi-decade highs. And again, our life expectancy is declining. So you have to ask yourself as a society, how many of you have actually run a business or organization? Imagine if that business or organization had the wrong measurements, how would it do over time? What are the three headline measurements the United States of America uses right now for its economic progress? GDP, headline, unemployment rate, and stock market prices, right? right? So GDP, even the inventor of GDP, Simon Kuznet, said 100 years ago, this is a terrible measurement for national well-being. We should never use it as that. 
And here we are 100 years later chasing it off a cliff. Self-driving trucks will be tremendous for GDP and very, very bad for many Americans. So if you're not excited about GDP, what actually would make you happy as people if I said this got better in your town? Average wage, average income and affordability, that would make you happy. How many of y'all are parents like me? Well, some of you should like get cracking. <laughs> <laughs> How about childhood success rates? How about mental health and freedom from substance abuse? Clean air and clean water. Health and life expectancy. Again, if it's heading the opposite direction of GDP, which is right, people, people's health or, or GDP. So we need to modernize our measures of economic progress. And as your president, it will be my joy to go down the street to the Bureau of Economic Analysis and say, hey, GDP, 100 years old, kind of out of date. We need to modernize it for a new era and include health and life expectancy, mental health, environmental quality. And I'll present this to our people every year at the State of the Union. I'll be the first president to use a PowerPoint deck at the State of the Union. Be like superimposed next to my head. We'll use some technology for it. The bottom 80% of Americans own about 8% of stock market wealth. Uh, bottom 50% own about zero. So if you're cheerleading stock market prices, you're essentially, essentially tracking the fortunes of the top 20% of Americans. And the headline unemployment rate masks all of this weakness, and masks the fact that uh, 90 million Americans have left the workforce, and masks the fact that 40 to 44% of recent college graduates are underemployed in a job that doesn't require a degree. It masks, uh, it masks the fact that 94% of new jobs created in the United States are temp gig or contract jobs that don't have a meaningful path forward or healthcare benefits in many cases. The headline unemployment rate is essentially government malpractice at this point. So if you have these three key measurements, you have to modernize them as quickly as possible so that we, we're not caught in the trap we're in right now, which is that we're beating everyone over the head saying things are great, and then they're looking around their community saying like, huh, things don't seem so great. Uh, my kids don't have a future that's any better than mine. In many cases, it's worse. If I do send them to college, uh, they're getting loaded up with record levels of debt. And yet, you just keep cheerleading these economic indicators that have very little relationship to what's happening in my community. So these are the big changes we need to make as a country as quickly as possible. First, we need to have a dividend of $1,000 a month that will help move our country forward very, very quickly. And second, we need to update our measurements for the 21st century so that we can actually see how we're doing, see what the real problems are, and then put our energies to work solving those problems. So hopefully after you spend a little bit of time with me and the platform, you understand how we have gone from total anonymity to fourth and national polls, how right now we're rising very, very quickly, where I am one of only two candidates in the field that 10% or more of Donald Trump voters say they would support in the general election. Think about that for a sec. What is the number one criteria that Democratic primary voters have for the nominee? Like Beating Donald Trump. That's right. And as one of only two candidates that's already drawing 10% or more of Donald Trump voters, I am as sure a bet as there is in the field. Democrats around the country are waking up to the fact that if I am the nominee, we win the whole thing in 2020. And as more Americans discover that, you're just going to see the poll numbers go up and up and up. So hopefully this gives you some indication as to how the anonymous entrepreneur has come out of nowhere to make not just every debate stage, uh, but also we're going to make history in 2020. Anyone betting against this campaign is going to look uh, very much in the wrong come February when the voting starts. Because even the polls that show us rising don't indicate the core strength of this campaign. Many, many people who are coming out for Andrew Yang don't have landlines, don't respond to pollsters, aren't registered Democrats. Uh, I can't tell you how many thousands of people around the country have contacted us saying they're switching their campaign, uh, their party registration so they can vote for us. Uh, you underestimate this campaign uh, to your own detriment because at every stage we have overperformed and that's just going to accelerate in the days to come. Donald Trump's our president in part because he got some of the problems right. If you remember in 2016, what did he say? He said, we're going we're gonna to make America great again. And then what was Hillary Clinton's response? 
America is already great. You remember that? And that did not work out. He got some of the problems right, but his solutions are the opposite of what we need. His solutions were we're going to build a wall, we're going to turn the clock back, we're going to bring the old jobs back. We have to do the opposite of all of these things. We have to turn the clock forward. We have to accelerate our economy and society as quickly as possible. We have to evolve in the way we think about ourselves and work and value. And I'm the ideal candidate for that job because the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. Thank you very much, everyone. Let's make America think harder and make history together in 2020. Thank you all.